Uzi Gal believed, he felt that through his own studies, that for a bolt carrier this wide required two separate action springs, as opposed to just the one. Okay? So, I wasn't there to conduct the studies, but in the parts that I found of his, I found um, bolt carriers with holes for one spring, I found them with two springs, I found all kinds of different types of, uh, uh, of spring assemblies, so um, I'm going to trust the man on it and, uh, and leave it up to his judge part from the carrier. And okay, so the firing pin here has a spring on it, so it goes to its rear position and helps prevent any uh, chance of, um, of, uh, of slam fires. Now, one of the most interesting things he's done on this rifle is right here in this bolt. I'll get a close up in a second, but I want you to talk about it. Is that these locking logs here are all on a canted angle. They're all, um, they all have an angle in front of them. And the reason is, the question is why? The answer is, uh, he believed that he had a very, very, very dirty barrel extension. This rifle does have a barrel extension, much like an AR-15. Um, that the if it was a squared off lug and there's a lot of dirt in there when this came into the extension and rested against the bolt face right here not the bolt face sorry the, the the shoulder here would rest against the shoulder of the barrel if there was excessive dirt it would prevent um, proper locking it would uh, prevent this from sitting flush and, and, and hence the uh, the bolt wouldn't turn the rifle wouldn't fire you have to clean it out. This little space here would go ahead and lock up. The dirt would go ahead and go under the little cutouts there, the little um, canted areas, so we could actually go ahead and lock and turn, fire, and go ahead and extract, you know, turn and open and extract and pushing the dirt out of the way. It's really quite an ingenious design, which you see a lot of na nowadays, a lot of companies are actually copying that. Like uh, Sharp Spill Spec actually makes, they call it the zero fail bolt, I think it is, or uh, something like that, that actually went ahead and, and kind of not copied the design, but I'm going to say they went ahead and, and, and discovered it on their own accord. One of the most well thought out designs of this rifle is the bolt, especially the bolt face. If you look here, the size of the ejector is 4 millimeters. The size of the extractor is quite large and quite beefy. Um, it was told to me that Uzi Gal spent four years just deciding or um, examining different sizes of uh, ejectors and extractors. And I have here an old bolt to show, kind of up next to it. Different um, uh, different ejectors. Different bolt uh, faces. You notice here, the bolt face here is mostly flat. Here, the bolt locking lugs are all on an angle. Now, anybody who knows any machining um, will notice this angle very similar to that as of a, uh, of a collet that you would use in a, uh, in a mill. Now, he actually took this, the shape of, this, uh, of these um, angles for the uh, locking lugs uh, from a collet from a machine, from a mill, uh, and he felt that it would do a few things. First off, the angle itself, the fact that it's cut, helps it to clear debris and dirt and grime out of the way from the from the face of the, um, the barrel extension. Now imagine you have a regular AR-15 bolt and it's flat. All that uh, debris would go ahead and be pushed forward and prevent, and form a little, um, little barrier of dirt and debris between the bolt face and that of the, uh, the barrel shoulder where it actually locks up against. Now, hence, you know, possibly preventing proper uh, closure of the bolt. Now this here, would allow that dirt and grime to be underneath, hence not, not preventing it from locking up, allowing it to fire under the harshest of all conditions. Uh, you notice there's a couple manufacturers nowadays making AR-15 bolts exact same way. And here's something that Uzi Gal did back in 1972 or something. Um, there's a rotating bolt design, and I'll show you here. This, when, when outside or when in the forward position, it actually locks into place. Again, so when AR, you have to actually go ahead and kind of uh, snap that bolt head forward to put it back in. This would, would already be in place right here. And you push this back. You do a little, uh, little lever down. It frees up the bolt. It can't. It, it turns. 
the firing pin comes back there, there's a little push down, push in, this is the firing pin, this slides out, and the bolt is free to come ahead and come on out. This here I have some different bolts, this is actually an earlier model it looks like, much bigger. Another one of those. The lower receiver here, you notice the trigger group is very similar to that of an M1 carbine. But one thing you notice is that the trigger group, uh, the sear pins for the trigger and hammer are very, very close together. And he felt the closer you kept these two sear pins, the more robust, the more durable the trigger would actually be. Notice when the hammers, the triggers pulled, the hammer goes up. This hammer is a massive hammer, very strong. He was afraid of how hammers cracking. He said he's seen that in other um, One other thing you notice is that the safety, and this is not the original safety, this is something that was made afterwards because the original safeties I think were all missing, can be put on safe, semi, and auto from any position, even if the hammer is forward. I'll show that in a second. Okay, safety can still be activated. And unlike the Galil, unlike the AK, the rifle could be in safe and the rifle still charged. And that was something he wanted to happen. He, he felt that it was very important that a rifle should be able to be charged with the safety on so the round could be in the chamber and the safety could be Another on. thing to note here is that the space in the back of the trigger group here in the, in the lower receiver was designed on purpose to be an empty storage space. Now, not for batteries like you have nowadays, but you remember that this rifle has a quick uh, release barrel, you can you change barrels in a hurry, and the idea was to go ahead and keep different trigger packs here. The idea was in the future to make a trigger pack that dropped into here, you push your two pins in, you locked it in place, and when you wanted to, you can pull out that trigger pack, put in, the, put in another trigger pack with a different barrel. So let's say you had a long, uh, long, accurate barrel, you can go ahead and put in a double stage match trigger, you can put in a three round burst trigger, you can put in a full auto trigger uh, for, a, for an LMG version. So that's what this uh, space was for. This space was actually for original, originally for another trigger pack to be able to be swapped out um, in the field with uh, this trigger pack right here. This is the original piston system. Here is a different piston system actually with a, um, with a roller, bolt roller on the piston itself. This one was actually um, was uh, milled off flat here, I'm not sure why, but that must have been for some design idea he had. Here is another piston system that kind of looks like a shape of a medieval mace. Also, this piston is floating. This is the bolt carrier. You notice on this bolt carrier, right here, there's a little cutaway. I have another carrier just like it, right here. And I was told that's for a, uh, the idea was to put in a, um, an AR-15 style forward assist. Because remember, this, this charging handle is not reciprocating, so they want to put in an AR-15 style forward assist. Now here's another piston. It's actually the same style of piston as this. A lot smaller. And this piston is not floating. It's connected directly to the, uh, the, the bolt carrier. You notice here in this particular bolt carrier, there's something welded, this little cap welded on the back. Uh, it is a later bolt carrier because of this here. Notice this one doesn't have it, this one does. And I do not really know what that's for. Just thought it would be interesting to let you guys see that he welded something on here and I'm not really sure if it was designed to act, kind of go into some sort of a recoil pad or what to kind of dissipate the energy from slamming against the back of the rifle. I don't really know, but it's interesting to note nonetheless. Maybe it was for a proprietary bolt that would fit in here somehow. I, I can't really tell, but there is a hole drill through there, so and here we have sure. an upper receiver here. Here's another upper receiver. You notice they are both slightly different sizes. This is a much beefier style. And I believe this was supposed to be 762 by uh, 51 upper receiver. I know that one of the rifles in a private collector's hands is actually 762 by 51 upper receiver. Um, these ribs here on the upper receiver also to be found here. Or, um, to keep the magazine from magazine will give it some extra strength and rigidity so the magazine gets hit or, or, or slammed it wouldn't bend the sheet metal and notice this sheet metal is um, quite a bit thicker than this one here is actually the barrel trunnion it's very interesting remember this is a rifle from the 60s and 70s 
right there. M4 cuts. Feed ramps cuts on the barrel trunnion, just like you have an M4. We have a very old barrel extension of his. This would seem to made up just like such. Maybe not. This might have been a 762. Here we have some different piston styles. This is a modified M14 piston. Actually, when we first opened the boxes, I saw a bunch of these in there. And I thought these were all M14 pistons at first. Um, some were actually had the longer uh, strike face over here, and some actually were M14 pistons that were just modified. Uh, this one here is a different type of piston. It's got a conical head here, and uh, I guess it's just from part of his experiments discovering what to, to use. And here is a much, much shorter piston. Here we have different designs of front side posts. Um, they seem to be just front side posts and not attached to a gas block. It looked like he wanted to go that route at one point in time. I notice here is uh, stamp number 11, that's number 8, that's number 12. Here's a little box, there's a tre treasure trove of stuff, just different piston styles, different bolts, tubes, pistons. I think that Uzi Gal had all these parts built one at a time. Um, you know, it wasn't CNC in those days, it was all done by uh, hand machining and lathe work where he would have parts made, uh, tested, decommission that rifle, build another one, destroy that rifle, build another one, and just to go ahead and, and, and build this rifle over the course of years. It was really, truly was a lot of work and effort and thought put out into this stuff. And it's really is amazing just to go through all this history right here and just see it and have it in my hands. It's, it's unbelievable. Okay guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video about the Uzi Gal rifle. Uh, it really is a fascinating piece of history, and especially for me, because uh, it's an Israeli piece of history, and I'm here in the Israeli arms industry. Um, anyone who wants to study firearms development and design really has to take a good look at this rifle. There are many unique things here in this rifle that were, uh, that were unique for the time, and that have later since been adopted, um, not necessarily being, by being copied, just by uh, other developers and designers conducting similar or same experiments and coming to the same conclusions that Uzi Gal came to. Uh, I hope this gives you an appreciation for the man who's got himself. He really was a, a genius from talking to you know people who worked around him. He, he really was a genius, a little bit eccentric, a bit of a hypochondriac, um, but he really was a genius when it came to firearms design. He, he really thought everything through from A to Z. He spent years uh, just studying things like, as I said, um, piston design, trigger design, uh, bolt and carry design, extractors, ejectors, everything he did. In this rifle, he thought th he thought through A to Z, um, and I want to leave you a little like a minute long video here of just um, in the end. So I don't want to bore you if you don't want to watch it, but of the guy I learned from, uh, Ephraim, uh, him taking apart this rifle and showing me and how excited he was and how excited I am to kind of learn from him uh, and, and kind of tracing back you know how one student learns from his teacher, who learned from his teacher, learned from his teacher. So again, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please leave it in the comment section. I'll try to answer it. זה <laughs> 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 לא חילוף, חלקים עם מנגנון אחר. אה, למה? אתה רוצה לבדוק לאיזה שלושה כדורים, לחמישה כדורים, למה שאתה רוצה. שאתה מחליף כאילו בשטח? כן. ופה, אתה רואה, כל זה, אתה רואה בפשוט בפרודקשן, זה עשוי ככה, זה עשוי מפח, אתה מכניס פה את הפיסה וזה אתה מרתך. פה וולדינג אתה עושה. אתה רואה את זה פה? כן. ואז זה... חלק אחד, הוא, ככה, הוא סגור ככה, אתה שם בפנים, ואז יש לו חוזק מכני מאוד גדול. תראה איך זה יושב, אין פה שום דבר. זה סטי, שיט מטאל, זה אלוי, כל זה מטאל. עכשיו, האדריכה, תראה, 
זה נמצא פה. אוקיי. Okay. הבנתי. עכשיו אתה יכול לדרוך גם ככה וגם ככה. הבנתי. הוא לא עשה אחד שמאלי? זה? כן, הוא היה... אתה עושה פה חורג בצד שמאל, אתה הופך אותו. אה. זה בפרודקשן, הנה. אתה פותח את זה, אתה רואה? כן. אבל אתה שם אחד בצד שמאל. היה לו אחד. אצלו. עכשיו תסתכל פה. זה אלה. אלה של הפקנה שיושב. אוקיי. פה, על שני אלה, אתה רואה? כן. ופה באמצע נכנס הקיל בינינו, זה, כל זה. אוקיי, הבנתי. 